Okay, we see that. Can you see the presentation now? Can you see the presentation? Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me? So, can, what do you see on the screen? Presentation. Okay, should I start? Yes, okay. I'm sorry for the, the technical difficulties. You know, I had to reboot my computer and start again. So I'm very happy to see that some of you have stayed on to listen to some, something I call Puranic Time and the Archaeological Record. You know, my, we'll talk a little bit about the Puranic Time. The Puranas are the Vedic histories and uh, sometimes people ask me, you know, we're, we're talking about Vedic, we're talking tonight or today about uh, Vedic theology, Vedanta theology. So why are you bringing in Puranas? Well, Chandogya Upanishad says that the Puranas are considered to be the fifth Veda. So on this concept of Puranic time, we should understand it's a cyclical concept of time, and the basic unit of this cyclical time is called the Kalpa, and three, two billion years. It's divided into 14 Manvantar periods, each one lasting about 306.7 million years. According to the Vedic cosmological calendar, we're now in the seventh or Vaivasvata Manvantar. But the Puranas, like the Bhagavat Purana, tell us some interesting things. For example, in this text from the Bhagavat Purana, we learn that human beings were created during the reign of Swayambhuva Manu. So the Swayambhuva Manvantar is the first one in the current Kalpa. Uh, today we are in the seventh Manvantar and the Puranas tell us that human beings were existing since the beginning of the Kalpa, which is millions of years ago. Human beings have been present through uh, the different Manvantars up to the seventh Manvantar, the one we're in now. Now that's something a little bit different than modern science tells us. According to modern science, the first human beings like us came into existence only 300,000 years ago. So we may ask, is there any evidence that humans like us have been present on Earth for more than 300,000 years? You know, the Puranas tell us we've been here many millions of years. And for me, the Puranas are evidence. A statement from the Puranas is evidence. So if the Puranas say we've been here millions and millions of years, 
Well, I'm personally prepared to accept the Puranic statement as evidence, but if I go to a scientific conference, I, I can't give them a statement from the Puranas as evidence. They want material evidence. They want some stones and bones that have been dated. Of course, there are some uh, archaeologists, some scientists, Haber, for example, says that archaeology should include non-material evidence and non sources of knowledge. So, um, but if I go to IIT Chennai, like I've done in the past, they they won't accept a statement from the Puranas as evidence in the science class. But what I can do in a scientific situation is make a prediction. If what the Puranas say is true about <clears throat> uh, extreme human antiquity, then there should be reports of archaeological evidence for humans existing much further back in time than 300,000 years. So my method for testing that prediction is to examine all archaeological reports Darwin to the and that took me about eight years and my first finding is not so surprising. There are no reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the current secondary literature textbooks, for example. But more interesting, you know, if we go beyond to the textbooks, to the primary scientific literature, by which I mean original reports by archaeologists and geologists who are digging into the layers of the earth, published in their professional scientific literature. If we look at that, then we find there are many reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the primary scientific literature, past and present. So I collected those reports in this book, Forbidden Archaeology, which I co-authored with Richard Thompson. And our question was, why is this evidence if it's present in the original scientific reports, not printed in the secondary literature, the textbooks. We proposed it was because of a process of knowledge filtration. We can call the blue box the knowledge filter. And what it represents is the dominant consensus in a scientific discipline. It can also be called a paradigm, the set of concepts and practices that define a scientific discipline. And you know, this term paradigm was introduced by Thomas Kuhn, a philosopher of science, in his very influential book, The Structure, of scientific revolutions. Uh, Kuhn said, in the absence of a paradigm, all of the facts that could possibly pertain to the development of a given science are likely to seem equally relevant. 
But when you have a paradigm like the theory of evolution or the Big Bang theory, then there's some basis for judging evidence. And what tends to happen is that the evidence that goes along with the current paradigm or consensus passes through this knowledge filter very easily, which means you see it mentioned in the textbooks. But if there's evidence that contradicts the dominant consensus or paradigm, it gets filtered out. And these things that are filtered out are called anomalies. And Thomas Kuhn wrote, discovery commences awareness of anomaly, that is, with the recognition that nature has somehow violated the paradigm-induced expectations that govern normal science. In other words, when you recognize something doesn't fit, that can make you think, well, maybe we have to reform our ideas, and that way science makes advancement. So, now I'm going to talk about the archaeological record. <clears throat> and we'll start with a very recent case from Ulduvai Gore in East Africa. of human evolution that own tools were, were found at Olduvai Gorge. And most archaeologists think bone tools were only made by homo sapiens of modern type. Uh, they, they don't think that any of their alleged ancestors of modern humans made them. And among the artifacts, bone tools that were found, was a barbed, what they called a barbed bone point for like a harpoon or something like that. Um, the oldest barbed point they had up to the discovery of this find was one from the the Katanda site in the Republic of Congo, and it was determined to be about 90,000 years old. So that is within you know, the range of the modern Homo sapiens species to archaeologists. Like I said, the uh, scientists today think humans like us first came into existence about 300,000 years ago. So 90,000 years, that's well within the accepted range. But they found, the one they found recently, they determined to be at least 800,000 years old and perhaps up to 930,000 years old. Now that's outside the range of the modern human according to them. Of course, it would be consistent with what the Puranas tell us. So, when they found out that this, this harpoon point was older than the modern human species, well, they had two choices. One is to elevate the cultural status of the ape man, Homo erectus, to that of modern Homo sapiens. Or you could extend the presence of humans from 300,000 years back to 800,000 years. Now, what do we think they chose to do, these scientists? Of course, they chose the first option. You know, they wrote in their report published in the Journal of Human Evolution this year, the 
W.K. East specimen, that's the, the one we were talking about, pushes back the origin of barbed bone points by at least 700,000 years, and it implicates Homo erectus as the inventor of this technology. And why was that? Well, because they were convinced that humans didn't exist at that time and that only Homo erectus was present, as shown in their direct statement. I'm quoting from their report. The formations in which the barb bone point was found were... <clears throat> Oops. The formations in which the barred bone point were, was found were, quote, deposited when only Homo erectus was known to be in the, known to have existed in the region. In other words, humans couldn't have existed, so they just chose to elevate the cultural status of Homo erectus. But I would say, you know, if we're going to be totally objective, that we find that this bar point is like that made by recent humans. So we have to consider the possibility that humans like us existed 800,000 years ago. <clears throat> so uh, another case fairly recent case from 2015. Archaeologists working at the Ulduvai Gorge discovered a finger bone. They called it the OH-86 finger bone. And actually, it's this finger bone of the human hand. And they carefully studied it, and they found it was different than the same finger bone in different species of apes and monkeys. They found it was different from the uh, so-called alleged human ancestors like Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and they found it fit in the modern human group. <clears throat> So they concluded in their report, OH-86 represents a hominin species whose closest form affinities are to modern Homo sapiens. However, the geological age of OH-86 obviously precludes its assignment to Homo sapiens. So I'll translate that into more easily understandable English. We have this, the scientists were thinking, we have this finger bone. It's exactly like that of modern Homo sapiens, but we can't call it Homo sapiens because of the age of the geological formation in which it was found, which was 1,800,000 years. So, it's too old to be human, therefore it can't be human. That's, that's how this knowledge filtering process operates. And it kind of fits in with things that Thomas Kuhn said. But I would say there's no reason not to think that OH-86 should be assigned to Homo sapiens and be given an age of 1.84 million years. So in, in these last two cases, we've seen examples where scientists are confronted with evidence that shows modern human beings existed a long time before they think possible, but they just don't recognize it for what it is. They make it fit 
into their existing theories. <clears throat> Another recent case of that, in the United Kingdom, uh, scientists discovered dozens of human footprints at this place in the United Kingdom. And they very carefully studied them and they found they're exactly like those of modern humans. But they were found in a formation 700,000 years old. So they decided it couldn't be humans like us it must belong to some human ancestor they called Homo antecessor, who they think must have had feet exactly like modern human feet. <clears throat> uh, just another case of knowledge filtration. In 1979, Mary Leakey announced the discovery of footprints at a place called Laetoli in Tanzania. And she announced in her report, the Laetoli footprints are indistinguishable from modern human footprints. Yeah, but they're found in layers of rock 3,700,000 years old. So paleontologist Tim White agreed with her Make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. So how did Mary Leakey explain these footprints? She said, well, there must have been some kind of ape man like Australopithecus who existed almost four million years ago and had feet exactly like modern human feet. It's an interesting proposal, but you know, we have the bones of Australopithecus that existed four million years ago, and their feet are not exactly like modern human feet. They're like those of a chimpanzee. You know, they have a, a long first toe that can go out to the side, like the human thumb, their other toes are very long, like short human human fingers. Um, the only creature actually known to science that has a foot exactly like a modern human foot is a human being like ourselves. So what did Mary Leakey actually find? I think she found further evidence that humans like us existed millions of years ago. How far back in time can we go with evidence like this? In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California in the United States, and miners went there to get it. And they dug tunnels into the sides of mountains, such as Table Mountain in uh, Tuolumne County, California. And deep inside these tunnels, the miners found human bones and human artifacts. Uh, for example, they found this stone mortar at a depth of 200 feet from the surface and about 1,800 feet in from the mouth of the tunnel. So these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. Whitney, and they're interesting to me because according to modern geologists, the formations in which they were found belong to the geological period called the Eocene, which means they would be about 50 million years old. So they came to, to, to the attention of J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. 
And he wrote a massive book about these discoveries. It was published by Harvard University in the year 1880. But we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of the process of knowledge filtration. Uh, there was an anthropologist, William Holmes, who worked at the Smithsonian Institution, and he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have published that report. He should have known it couldn't possibly be true according to the theory of evolution. In other words, if the facts did not conform to the theory, then the facts should have been brushed aside and forgotten. And that's what happened. But some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the collection of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. And I got permission from the directors of the museum to study and photograph them, and some of them are here. I also went to Table Mountain, and that's what it looks like today, and we found some of the old mining tunnels where these objects were originally discovered. Um, there are hundreds of cases like this. I've just mentioned a few. I could keep you here for many days going through one case after another. What I'll say about this evidence is that it's consistent with the accounts of the piranhas, which tell us humans like us have existed on Earth since actually the beginning of the history of life on this planet. So, I'll, I'll start to bring this to an end by uh, reading a little bit from a review of my book, Forbidden Archaeology, that was published in uh, the British Journal for the History of Science. And the archaeologist Tim Murray wrote, Forbidden Archaeology, quote, provides the historian of archaeology with a useful compendium of case studies in the history and sociology of scientific knowledge, which can be used to foster debate within archaeology about how to describe the epistemology of one's discipline. And that's what we were trying to do in, in writing that book. We were trying to get archaeologists to start thinking about the way they treat evidence in their discipline. And he also wrote, and this is in connection with the theme of this conference, you know, Vedantic theology and its relationship to modern science. Tim Murray wrote, the dominant paradigm has changed and is changing, and practitioners openly debate issues which go right to the conceptual core of the discipline. Whether the Vedas have a role to play in this is up to the individual scientist's concern. And I think for the world of modern science, that is a step forward. So I think it is possible that Vedanta theology has a role to play in the advancement of modern science. So, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know you've been, if you've 
kept up since the beginning. You've been around for a, a long time, so I wanted to keep this a little bit short. Uh, these are some of my books, which are available from my website and from many in many other ways. You know, they're available as ebooks through Amazon and uh, Nook and some contact information. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanking also the organizers you know, for helping me get through this, through the technical difficulties in the beginning. Again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh Dr. Kramer, so there are a few questions now uh, which audience want to ask and uh, one of them is uh, can you please tell us about the marine excavation of Dwarka and the Ram Setu? Yes, so as far as Dwarka is concerned, yeah, I'm getting getting feedback from somewhere. But um, yeah, as far as Dwarka is concerned, um, there was the work was uh, was done by uh, a marine archaeologist from India named Dr. S. Rao, and of course Dwarka, as many of you know, was a, a city where lord krishna lived when he was present on earth about five thousand years ago and at a certain point the piranhas tell us that the city of dwarka was flooded you know after krishna left the the ocean rose and covered the, the city of Dwarka. So there is still a city in Gujarat in northwestern India that is called Dwarka. So many people wondered, is, are there remains of Krishna's city that can be found in the sea off the coast of the present city of Dwarka. So this uh, marine archaeologist from India, Dr. S. Rao, he started exploring the seacoast off, off the uh, present city of Dwarka. And he did find remains of an ancient city there. Um, now, uh, Dr. Rao once came to the United States and he visited the center of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in Los Angeles. And uh, Dr. Richard Thompson and I were there and we invited him to show a film of his archaeological research work about Dwarka, and he was kind enough to do that. So it's very interesting that these remains are there off, off the coast of the present city. As far as the Ram Setu Bridge is concerned, that relates to an account from the Ramayana, one of the epic literatures of India. It tells the story of an avatar of God by the name Ram, who, whose wife, whose wife, Sita, was taken to the island of Lanka from India, from South India. Uh, 
this King Ravan uh, kidnapped the wife of Rama. Her name was Sita. To recover his wife, Ram, along with some monkey soldiers, made a bridge of floating stones from South India to the island of Lanka, which some identify with the modern island nation of Sri Lanka. And even today, between South India and Sri Lanka, there is a chain of underwater sandbars, according to some, that uh, leads from South India to uh, Lanka. And some people have called it uh, Ram's Bridge or, or Ram Setu. And it is interesting that if you, and as many geologists have, look into those so-called uh, sand, sand, uh, sandbars, that they have large pieces of stone. We are sending to you messages to unmute you. There are large pieces of stone that really don't belong there geologically. So that, and, and some have said that this evidence proves the existence of Rama's bridge at about 1.8 million years ago. Um, so that's that's what I know about those two cases. Oh, yeah, wonderful explanation, uh, Dr. Kremo. So one more uh, question is there uh, by Soumya Gupta. We read in Srimad Bhagavatam that people in bygone ages had more height. So is the size of footprint or finger bone similar to what we have today? Is there a mismatch here? Because we would expect bigger footprint footprint for past human beings. Uh, it depends what period that we're talking about. And it also depends on uh, what we think is getting bigger and, and smaller. It may... Uh, but see, one thing to consider is that uh, in my work, I've been focusing on what is scientifically discovered. Now, this gets into another area of knowledge filtration, which is evidence for the existence of large size humans in the distant past. And it is a fact that there have been many reports of discoveries of large size human bones. Um, but I'm, I haven't really mentioned that topic here, but that is something to also consider there have been many reports of such things but they tend to be not presented in scientific journals there is a case from uh, france however which was reported in scientific journals in the late uh 19th century and early 20th century and that has to do with, with the case where a French archaeologist reported finding at a place called Castle Now in France 
a large size human femur. Femur is the thigh bone. And if you know the size of a femur, you can estimate the height of a person who had a femur that size. So this French archaeologist reported and showed, showed photographs and measurements of a human femur that was uh, about uh, as many, it was older than it should be, but it was a person with a femur that size would have been over 11 feet tall, which would be a giant, you'd have to say. So there are some reports of things that uh, Sonia was talking about, but you know, in the scientific world, we'll go step by step. First, I would like to get them to accept the idea that humans have been around, humans like us, have been around for a long, long time. And then we'll move on to giants, larger things. So, uh, one more question is there. Uh, when we will going to see your next upcoming new book? Hopefully next summer, uh, 2021. So one good thing about you know, the lockdowns and the everything is that I haven't been traveling all over the world, so I've got more time to finish up these literary projects. Thank you for asking. So, uh, participants are asking a lot of questions. Uh, I think they are uh, uh, liking it so much. So I, I'll take just last one question. Uh, this question has come from Prabhat Kumar Singh. And he says that, sir, the animals ever talked about in the Vedas are natively found only in South Asia. How to relate this fact with the Puranic time? Also, is there a mention of dinosaurs because archaeology sure proves they did exist? Okay. Uh, I think it would be an excellent project for some some somebody who who knows sanskrit and the other indian languages to do a and maybe this has already been done but i would like to see a, a complete list of all the different species the different kinds of plants and animals and humans that are mentioned anywhere in all of the Puranas, all of the Vedic, you know, the Itihasas, all of the Vedic texts. I don't know if anyone has done that yet, but it would be an excellent project. Um, so, I, until that's done, I can't really answer the the question as far as dinosaurs are concerned yeah, there's in the bhagavad purana there's an account of uh, the sons of lord krishna went out from dwarka and with krishna and they were going through the forest and they found a big hole in the ground like a big well or something and in the bottom of this uh, large depression they saw there was a creature and they 
with with great effort they pulled out this huge creature described as a and described in the sanskrit of the bhagavad purana as a lizard as big as a mountain now i don't know when when i think of a lizard as big as a mountain it calls to mind a dinosaur and sometimes you see creatures like that depicted in temple carvings on the walls of vedic temples like at in uh, the Angkor Wat area of Cambodia. I've been to different temples in India where I've seen things that carved on you know, the ancient temple walls that at least resemble I dinosaurs. Okay, so I think now uh, we will have to stop because it's already nine o'clock. We can uh, answer all of your questions and we'll mail you the answers or uh, the voice bits of all of your questions. So now over to Rishi Kumar Prabhu for uh, conclusion and the announcements. Thank you very much. You know, that was a remarkable session. If not for the kind of time uh, that we are at right now, I guess the question and sessions would have gone on for another full session duration of yours. Thank you very much, as always, for an inspiring session. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, just a few questions for all of you that uh, we would seek your feedback. Uh, the, it'll be on iss.iscondelhi.org contact. So please fill up your feedback form about the sessions today and continue to do so. We'll be distributing certificates to all of you. That will be next week. We'll just try to see how we can make them available for you. That's a, a very important aspect to check. All of us, including you, will be looking forward to certificates from the box. That will be next week. And we're hoping that uh, tomorrow we'll probably try to migrate to a different platform um, for this uh, second day session. And we'll be sharing the link with you just in case. Um, we we'll try to see how that works out. But there were some obvious glitches, as you might have seen today. Uh, but at the end of the day, beg forgiveness again for any sort of issues that you might have faced. And importantly, we are grateful to all the wonderful. Uh, participants and the wonderful uh, speakers that we had arranged today. Thank you again for joining us and tomorrow we'll uh, join again with a fresh set of speakers. That'll be at uh, 4 p.m. onwards and tomorrow we'll feature uh, Mr. Akhidadi Das, a Vaishnava philosopher with a particular training in uh, integration of modern uh, science and philosophies. Uh, and then there will be Dr. Mauricio Garrido with a PhD in physics from the Ohio University. He'll be speaking about uh, deciphering the Puranic universe, Bhu Mandala as the horizontal plane, and uh, unlocking the scriptural mysteries and scientific rationality by Dr. Jyotiranjan Duria with a concluding session. Professor Suresh Balla on science and spirituality, the path forward. We do hope that you'll join us tomorrow again at 4 o'clock and 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Namaskar. Namaskar.